Hello and person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be discussing some of the most peculiar discoveries coming from somewhat strange objects referred to as brown dwarfs. But I guess more specifically, a recent discovery by the James Webb Space Telescope that discovered a very specific molecule that suddenly changes a lot of things for astrobiology. And in this case we're discussing a molecule we've actually talked about approximately five years ago, referred to as phosphine. Something that for a very long time was believed to be what's known as a biosignature. And so today we're going to discuss a kind of a profound puzzle for astronomers and atmospheric chemists that technically directly affects our search for extraterrestrial life. And that's because based on the recent study we're going to be discussing today, and specifically based on this study you can find in the description, what we have observed on this distant cool brown dwarf, referred to as Wolf 1130C, is something that according to our best scientific models should be actually here. So in that sense this is an exciting confirmation of something that was predicted before. But the bizarre part is that until recently, and really until now, every single observation of virtually every other brown dwarf or any gas planet we've observed with the James Webb were actually suggesting that some of these predictions and some of these models of the existence of phosphine in these planets was maybe incorrect. And so there is a kind of a paradoxical discovery here that we do need to explore, and mostly from two different perspectives. From the perspectives of astrobiology and the search for extraterrestrial life, and from the perspective of planetary scientists that have always predicted certain molecules in certain types of planets. But first, we do need to briefly cover the concept of brown dwarfs, because this is something that is super bizarre and something that we do not have in the solar system. And so what exactly are these objects? Well, sometimes they're referred to as failed stars. A kind of a middle object between the largest gas planets like Jupiter and some of the smallest true stars that we often refer to as red dwarfs, with pretty much most of the discovered brown dwarfs having a mass of about 13 to maybe 80 masses of Jupiter. And some of them even contain enough mass to initiate early nuclear reactions. For example, some of these objects are briefly able to fuse specific types of heavy hydrogen such as deuterium, but in most cases often lack mass to continuously sustain the reaction or to fuse normal hydrogen that most stars rely on in order to produce energy. And so because most of them do not contain a stable way of generating energy, a typical brown dwarf is just going to cool down over billions of years, gradually dimming as they age. And in a lot of cases when we actually do find a brown dwarf that's somewhat cold and somewhat dark, it actually does imply an extremely high age, usually billions of years old and sometimes even almost as old as the universe. And we've discussed these objects in some of the previous videos and we do know quite a lot about them, mostly because some of the most fascinating such objects, the binary system referred to as Lomon 16, is one of our closest neighbors. In terms of distances, they're basically right after Alpha Centauri, which is why we have these beautiful pictures of these objects taken over the years. But the specific brown dwarf we're discussing today is a little bit farther away from us. And you can see the image of this brown dwarf right here. This is about 54 light years away from Earth and is essentially a triple system. Here we have a cold M-type subdwarf star and an ultramassive white dwarf orbiting each other. And at a slightly farther away distance, there is a cold brown dwarf companion, Wolf 1130C. And it's believed that the system is very old, very likely over 10 billion years old in total, with this particular brown dwarf potentially being one of the oldest known to us. But chances are that the binary system will eventually produce a type 1 supernova, which at some point might result in the destruction of the brown dwarf, or at least cause it to change dramatically and eventually kick it out of the system. Although this is not expected to happen for at least 6 billion years. But either way, this is definitely quite a unique system. But because the stars here are so old, they're also relatively poor in metals. Essentially, they mostly contain hydrogen and helium, and not so much of everything else. And this chemical composition may be the key to this new discovery. Because the molecule we're interested in is, of course, phosphine. The molecule consisting of phosphorus and three hydrogens. And this is a pretty well-known molecule on Earth, where technically it's also kind of toxic and quite flammable. But intriguingly, it's also mostly produced by anaerobic life. Here we're talking about various organisms that survive without oxygen and very often rely on decaying matter in order to produce nutrition. And so since biological sources dominate the production of phosphine on planet Earth, for an extremely long time this was proposed to be a definitive biosignature. 
a potential chemical indicator of some kind of a life somewhere out there. And this is exactly what happened a few years back when there was a potential detection of phosphine on Venus. And though at first this was a preliminary discovery, it was also redetected again back in 2024, which as you can imagine became very exciting for astrobiologists because it may have suggested some kind of an existence of life on Venus and specifically in the Venusian atmosphere. But the phosphine's identity as a biosignature is super complicated even in the solar system. And that's because gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn seem to also contain significant amounts of phosphine that's been detected many years ago. And that of course creates a bit of a paradox. Either Jupiter and Saturn also have a lot of microbial life, which I guess maybe could happen, or phosphine is also produced through some other means and very likely because of these extremely highly pressurized and very hot conditions inside of gas giants. And that was of course the main explanation for many years. So here intense heat and pressure causes phosphine to form naturally with very powerful atmospheric forces then bringing the gas up where it can then be detected by various probes. And eventually sunlight destroys it because this gas is not very stable. But these early observations from Jupiter and Saturn became the foundation for the observations of other gas giants and of course brown dwarfs. And so in these models the prediction was that phosphine should also be present in the low temperature hydrogen rich atmospheres of various brown dwarfs. And especially because we expect them to mix even better and so they should technically show even more phosphine. Yet for many years none of these brown dwarfs, even the ones super close to us, seem to show any signs of phosphine at all. And that was kind of bizarre. And bizarre basically until now. So let's take a look at this new discovery. Here by taking spectral observations in the infrared light, James Webb was able to reveal very specific spectral lines. And while here at 4.3 micrometers, there seems to be a very strong absorption feature. So basically something seems to be absorbing light coming from this brown dwarf. And that something, based on the spectral analysis, is currently suggested to be phosphine. And actually these spectral absorptions are very similar to what's been seen on Jupiter before. And this was an extremely clear detection that would be very difficult to interpret as anything else. But there's obviously not a lot of it. Currently the estimate suggests approximately 100 parts per billion, or about 0.00001%. And it's really this high abundance that's technically is also kind of strange. Because here it's consistent with disequilibrium atmospheric chemistry models, or same models based on Jupiter and Saturn that predicted this deep vertical mixing that should be bringing phosphine to the surface. Yet once again this is the only brown dwarf with these detections. None of the other exoplanets or gas giants or brown dwarfs consistently showed any similar data. Or if there was a possible detection it was usually hundreds of times lower than predicted. And one example that's mentioned by the scientists here is WISE 0855-0714. Here there was a preliminary detection of phosphine, but it seems to be at least 200 times lower than expected. Which suggests that these recent observations from WOLF 1130C are really really odd. Despite validating atmospheric models and predictions from years ago, it looks completely different from every single brown dwarf we've seen. And that means that our understanding of phosphorus chemistry and chemical dynamics may be incomplete or incorrect. But right now scientists do have at least two potential propositions on what's probably happening here. First, once again, this is a metal poor object and this low metallicity might be the dominant factor. And so because this object contains mostly hydrogen and mostly helium and not a lot of other stuff, here phosphorus might just create slightly different reactions. Now in a typical gas giant, or maybe in a typical brown dwarf containing a lot of different stuff, there's also going to be a lot of oxygen. And in certain conditions phosphorus might prefer to combine with oxygen to form phosphorus trioxide, effectively removing phosphorus for any potential additional reaction that would create phosphine. But in the low metallicity environment, like around this brown dwarf, there might be just not enough oxygen and instead a lot of phosphorus binds with hydrogen creating phosphine. And at the same time, because this object is also not going to contain a lot of carbon dioxide, pretty much for the same reason that there's just not enough carbon, not enough oxygen, here the carbon dioxide abundance is going to present us with a much better picture of the atmosphere, because sometimes carbon dioxide can also overlap with phosphine signals, making the observations much more difficult. So basically here phosphine is just easier to detect. But on top of this, the second suggestion is also that for some reason this object could be enriched in phosphorus. 
As a matter of fact, it seems to contain 1.7 times a amount of phosphorus compared to the Sun. And this could have been caused by one of its ancient partners. One of the stars here is a white dwarf. And white dwarfs are remnants of very old stars. And because this white dwarf is in a binary system, there's actually a chance that in the past it produced a lot of different nova explosions. Essentially explosions that result from the interaction of the white dwarf with its partner. And processes like NOVA can technically produce a lot of phosphorus, polluting the entire system. And so a lot of this phosphorus on the brown dwarf could have come from these earlier NOVA. Or alternatively, it could also have come from the galactic disk itself. And that's because this brown dwarf and this entire system seem to be located in the region of the Milky Way with very ancient materials, which might just provide more phosphorus for these objects compared to other stars close to the solar system. But yeah, in terms of why this object is so different, right now there's no exact explanation yet. But nevertheless, the confirmation of phosphine on this brown dwarf is very important. First of all, it seems to be consistent with previous planetary models. And so it definitely shows us that some of the previous models may be correct after all. But second of all, it definitely confirms that phosphine may not be a biosignature after all. But it also suggests that certain planetary models need to be re-evaluated because none of the other brown dwarfs have any of this. And so this major inconsistency is very important for planetary models. But much more importantly for astrobiology and for the search for extraterrestrial life, here the presence of phosphine on Jupiter, Saturn and this object almost definitively suggest that phosphine is currently a very unreliable sign of potential life. So basically it is not a good biosignature, even though this was the claim that I think I even made myself something like 10 years ago in one of the older videos. And so despite earlier exciting studies and despite detection of phosphine on Venus, we can now almost certainly say that it's very likely chemical in nature and is unlikely to be the result of life. I mean, it's still possible, which would obviously suggest that maybe all of these objects seem to contain some kind of a atmospheric life, but at this point it just becomes speculation because we do have inorganic and chemical explanation for how phosphine could form in these planets. And so the discovery on Wolf 1130c proves that non-biological and purely chemical mechanisms seem to produce phosphine and seem to generate spectral signatures we observe. And so for astrobiologists, this is a pretty big discovery that kind of invalidates a lot of previous assumptions about phosphine. But for atmospheric scientists and for planetary scientists, this also suggests that certain models need to be reworked because something here just does not add up. And so here we definitely need some kind of a deeper understanding of planetary dynamics and chemical reactions inside brown dwarfs and gas giants. But I guess for now at least, that's kind of all we know. We'll definitely discuss phosphine in some of the future videos once there are some additional discoveries or maybe some other propositions. But until then, check out some of the previous videos about Venus and previous discoveries from brown dwarfs in some of the videos in the description. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access and a few additional videos. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.